Okay, hello, uh, good afternoon and good morning and welcome to uh, Kepler's research webinar um, looking at a uh, broader commodity soup cycle. Uh, my name is Alex Booth, I'm the head of research with Kepler and today Reid is joining me from Houston as we have a look at uh, what we see going on, what kind of uh, what we can infer from the data that we see and how we're interpreting that in terms of can we say that there is a, a broader commodity super cycle kind of on the cards at the moment. So I'm just going to set the scene with a chart that looks at some of the um, major commodity prices um, indexed back to January 2019. Now you can see from the chart why there has been a lot of discussion and also kind of some potential hype around um, an impending commodity super cycle. Now, in uh, some commodities, we have seen solid gains um, over the course of the last year and a half or so. Now, what we are proposing is that in um, some sectors or some for some commodities, um, there is good reason to see continued sustained growth. However, in others, um, that's the fundamentals behind them just aren't really there to support that ongoing growth. You can see in the chart um, that Chinese iron ore prices are running now at 285% um, of January 2019 levels, whereas copper um, is sitting at just 170%. And then crude um, is sitting at just 123% um, of those uh, January 19 levels. So as I was saying, we feel that there are some short-term factors supporting uh, some of these commodities but not enough to kind of see a full-blown commodity super cycle as we did say back in the period prior to the GFC. So we think that copper is a commodity that um, for kind of structural reasons um, will see supported growth, but that focusing on iron ore and then uh, crude, um, the fundamentals behind them just aren't enough to warrant um, that moniker basically for, for different reasons. So without wanting to uh, still read Thunder, I'm gonna hand over to him and we're going to look first off at copper. So uh, thanks Alex. Um, there you go. So <laughs> there we go. Uh, so I'll be looking at two of the um, important industrial uh, bulk commodities in copper and iron ore and how these two commodities are both similar and different in several ways. So if we jump ahead uh, and first kind of take a historical look at copper prices, um, You'll notice that between 2002 and 2006, there was a huge run up in prices, well beyond anything that had been seen historically over the previous 30 year period. Um, this was uh, largely driven by strong Chinese demand. We did see a steep sell off in the wake of the financial crisis, but you'll notice um, that prices again pushed to all time highs headed into early 2011. Um, given the fact that we had a very robust um, Chinese fiscal rescue, rescue package that helped to support, uh, support bulks markets, including copper. And again, as I mentioned in 2011, prices peaked at um, quite elevated levels. But over the past, say, uh, half decade, Copper prices have largely um, held around the $2.50 per pound level. It is only over the past year that copper has yet again found its way higher. And just recently, volumes pushed to yet a new record high. Now, before we move forward, uh, it, it's important to consider what is driving copper prices right now. Of course, Chinese demand certainly driving prices again, especially last year and into this year, late last year and into this year, uh, Chinese demand looked strong uh, coming out of COVID. But keep in mind that prices are also dri being driven by forward expectations around Western infrastructure spending, 
especially since copper is a very in, important input into environmental in, infrastructure. And so it's important to keep that in mind as we move forward and talk about the demand side of the copper equation. So if we move forward here and we take a look at uh, monthly exports of, of copper, you'll notice that volumes really started to accelerate late 2019. And then 2020 had a banner year. Volumes were up by nearly 2,800 KT on a year over year basis. And you'll notice there were a handful of months, again, in late 2019 and well into 2020, where volumes were, were up by more than 500 KT on a year over year basis. This is impressive and definitely a break from earlier in the decade. And you'll note also that in 2020, more than half of all loaded volume, mined volume, was, uh, was loaded onto a vessel. It, it relied on seaborne markets. This was up from 41% in 2019 and 33% in 2018. Why is this relevant? This is relevant because most of the uh, volume that is being produced is far from where it is being consumed. And so I'll touch on this a bit in a, a later in the presentation, but within copper markets, particularly, the seaborne market is going to become increasingly important as, as areas of consumption look to purchase from areas of production. And these two locations are often quite separated. Now, uh, before we move forward, an important point here, um, and I'm going to con continue to hammer home this point, the increase in copper exports was and is indicative of rising demand for green infrastructure and electric vehicles, right? China has been the main reason for this growth over the past two decades. But as I mentioned before, Western countries will become a key and important uh, additional source of consumption. This is very important, right? Because this is allowing copper markets to diversify on the demand side of the equation, right? So even if you say see, see, uh, see weakness in China, uh, you're still likely going to have strong demand elsewhere, right? So you're diversifying your demand base within the copper market. This is very important. So let's actually move forward and think about the supply side of the equation. Most volume, most copper volume is being produced in Latin America, specifically Chile. 70% of all seaborne volume for copper comes out of Chile, right? Very important linchpin. And that's why we're going to focus right now. We're going to focus on Chile. Uh, late last year, the government announced expectations of nearly 75 billion in mining investments this decade, most of which centered in uh, within the copper industry. This is important, obviously, because uh, demand is going to be increasing moving forward. As I've mentioned, we're going to have that large and uh, diversified demand base. And so we're going to need more supply to, to, to meet demand. But there are issues. Um, there are problems with this. Um, the Chilean government has taken several steps to, um, to push back against investment. Uh, not to, uh, not by their own um, admission, but but it's having that effect nonetheless. They raised taxes on large copper producers last year. They also created new income limits linked to spot prices. And I would say most importantly, there is a constitutional referendum that is going to come up next year, and this creates a high degree of political uncertainty and. Keep in mind that the copper market in general has been uh, has been very conservative on the supply side for a number of years. Um, copper producers in general have been very focused on positive cash flows and a conservative investment approach. And so right now, uh, many of these produ producers are looking at Chile and saying it's not worth the risk because we've not taken those risks over the past half decade, and we feel that it's not worth it now. And so this is, this is going to 
amplify the price pressure on copper moving forward, right? Because one, as I mentioned, we're going to have that diversified demand base um, pushed both by um, purchases out of China and out of the West. But now we also have supply factors, right? We need more supply. And yet, especially in a place like Chile, that is politically unstable, um, or at least politically uncertain right now, uh, alongside unfavorable tax rules, are making the supply side increasingly constrained as well. And actually, let's move to the next slide. And this is data published by the International Copper Study Group. This is just the international body that looks at production and implied consumption. And this kind of drives home the point, right? Over the past nearly decade, uh, refined copper markets have been serially undersupplied, right? This is problematic and kind of plays into the fact that um, that producers have been focused on positive cash flows and, and conservative investment approaches rather than um, bringing focus on bringing on new supply, right? And this uh, is hopefully going to be, uh, will start to be alleviated this year. So like the ICSG um, predicted that we could see an 800 KD, uh, KT increase in production this year. But there are, again, a lot of questions around if that's going to happen. And again, I go back to the supply side of this question, which is that the industry itself is very conservative. It's very cash flow focused and oftentimes very unwilling to make new investments even now. And the problem is that um, let's say a lot of firms start to spend a lot of money now to invest. There are still long lead times and when mines are going to be opening and producing, right? So this is the core of our argument when it comes to copper and the fact that we are likely to see a super cycle over the next several years. That is um, strong price increases um, over a multi-year period. And again, just to, just to conclude this part of it, right? why? One, because of a diversified um, demand base out of China and out of the West, and two, because of distinct uh, supply side issues, namely out of Chile, um, and the fact that many industry players up until this point have been unwilling to take more risk and and are very focused on a conservative investment approach. So that's kind of our argument for copper. We are quite bullish on the red metal moving forward. And uh, now we will move on to looking at iron ore markets. Now, iron ore is in a lot of ways very similar to copper, especially uh, when it comes to pricing. I mean, that initial ramp up in prices uh, through, uh, uh, through 2010, you know, uh, but even in the years leading up to the financial crisis, very strong ramp in prices. This is very similar to copper, right? And and this was that period of time was a true super cycle. There were many commodities that were 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 trading higher at that point, including copper and iron ore. And that's why we talk about that period of time, right? It's relevant now that people are yet again thinking about the idea of a super cycle. But you'll notice that there was no large yet temporary sell-off in iron ore like there were in copper markets. Again, the reason I think this is was largely due to, again, the Chinese fiscal package that they passed through 2009, 2010. But unlike in copper markets, there was not really much of a, a demand scare in iron ore markets. You know, the, the Chinese passed this fiscal package and most people were, uh, most folks who were in the iron ore market were, were relatively confident that that would help to buoy demand. And it certainly did, right? Prices uh, like actually managed to continue pushing higher even through the, the depths of the financial crisis. Um, and this is, this is notable. Um, 
Now, obviously, prices did sell off into mid-decade, again, largely driven by Chinese economic performance, which um, certainly had its weak point um, through the middle of last decade. Um, and that was largely what drove prices. And we saw through the second half of last decade, a, a bit of an uptick in prices, slow but sure. But I mean, clearly, if you, if you look at the trend now, prices have spiked very quickly um, this year and, and early last year, uh, beginning early last year. But, but especially Q2 of last year, prices began to move higher very quickly. And this is no doubt, again, driven by Chinese demand, by the fact that the Chinese um, managed to recover quickly out of the COVID crisis. And it's also notable that in recent weeks, there have been a lot of discussions about a sell-off in iron ore markets. But you'll notice this graph is actually monthly averages. And you'll notice like on a monthly average, even into June, prices have continued to accelerate. So yes, the Chinese attempted to clamp down on speculative trading. Yes, they did make comments complaining about price moves. And yes, those comments made sense, given the fact that producer prices hit a hit uh, inflation hit 9% in May. Clearly, there are viable concerns there. But the problem is that the Chinese uh, cannot ultimately uh, impact prices just through words. Um, if they continue to consume iron ore at current rates, you're going to see prices um, remain strong. And uh, that's just a matter of supply and demand. But it's important to note, right? Iron ore will remain overly reliant on Chinese demand. So in copper markets, Chinese demand paired with Western demand is going to really drive that market. Not so true in iron ore markets, right? In iron ore markets, even much of the infrastructure spending that will take place in the West will emphasize the need for copper, even for things like cobalt um, and lithium. But iron ore will not be as a big a piece in that, in that broader um, discussion when it comes to Western infrastructure spending. And thus, Chinese iron ore demand will be centrally important, far more important than in copper markets. So actually, let's move to the next slide. And I'll discuss the Chinese uh, piece a little bit more in depth here in a moment. But just to kind of speak on the strength of iron ore exports into this year, you'll notice the graph on the right looks at volumes between January 1st and June 13th on a yearly basis, right? And you'll notice 2021 is having a banner first half of the year, um, only maybe equaled by that seen in 2018, but a big recovery against 2020. Um, keep in mind um, that much of this growth this year is actually being driven, uh, or, or much of this volume, excuse me, is being shipped to China, no surprises. Um, last year, China purchased around 75% of all seaborne iron ore, right? It dominated the market. But we have seen some growth in Japan, some growth in South Korea, helping to further accelerate iron ore markets as well. And in general, as I mentioned here in the comments, volumes through the first half of 2021 are up about 9 MT against year earlier levels now. This gain will pair a little bit through the second half of the year. Why? Because uh, 2020 volumes through the second half were extraordinarily strong, driven by Chinese demand. Um, obviously, as I mentioned, um, Q2 or Q3, Q4 were, were quite strong months for Chinese output in general, um, and their demand for iron ore equaled that. Um, so and it's important to keep that in mind. But more broadly, uh, iron ore uh, purchases were very strong through the second half of last year and have continued to be very strong through the first half of this year. This is helping to drive prices um, without a doubt. Now, let's move forward and think about um, and focus on the supply side of this equation now. I kind of mentioned this earlier, 
but China is dominating this market. Just to give you a reference, about China purchases about 40% of all seaborne copper. It purchases, as I mentioned, about 75% of all seaborne iron ore. This is off a little bit this year, but again, it, it dominates uh, it dominates the iron ore market. Um, now, this is uh, both a good and bad thing, depending on who you ask, right? Um, last year, China posted strong recoveries, and that helped to drive iron ore higher, right? But uh, this is a distinct problem as well, because you do not have strong demand diversification like you do in copper markets. And this is problematic because if you have any slowdown or issue in China, whether it's politically motivated, whether it's economically motivated, will heavily weigh on prices. And there's nowhere else that iron ore demand can kind of shift towards, right? This is, this is deeply problematic when discussing the, pro the possibility of a commodity super cycle. You're basically basing demand on one single country and and it is solely centered on China in this case. And so on the supply side of the question, this is kind of our concern is that iron ore is so overwhelmingly dependent on Chinese demand that any issue will could very well impact prices. Now, let's move to the next slide and think about the supply side of this equation as well. There are a lot of geopolitics um, wrapped up in Chinese-Australian relations right now. Um, obviously, China and Australia are very closely linked, especially when it comes to commodities. And so it's very important that we highlight it here. And this is very relevant to the supply side discussion of iron ore markets. So as I mentioned here, in 2020, Australia exported 60% of all iron ore, far beyond the second largest producer, which is Brazil, at 18%. So even, uh, uh, even if China, say, wanted to shift all of its demand away from Australia, it wouldn't be physically possible right now, right? This is important to note because obviously Australia and China have deep geopolitical disagreements right now. And this is a risk factor for iron ore markets. Um, and that if China makes any kind of move to say cut back consumption of iron ore because it wants to deal with more harshly with um, Australia, that could impact iron ore markets. Also important to note when it comes to Australia in, in particular, Producers there have been readily willing over the past decade to meet increases in demand. So unlike in copper markets, iron ore markets have been readily oversupplied over the past half decade. And there are plans, Australian producers have plans to add yet more capacity, um, plenty of additional capacity over the next five years. And so unlike in copper markets, uh, uh, iron ore supply is and iron ore producers have been more than willing to meet the demand requirements globally, and that's going to continue moving forward. Now, it is important we should all we always need to talk about Brazil. They're a, they are a notable second largest producer, and as many of you know, they've had serious issues with output since 2015, uh, given multiple dam disasters. Um, that have pulled down on production by several MT over the last few years. And we've seen yet again this year, they're having issues um, near Mina Jure. Um, authorities there are limiting movement around the Jingju uh, Dam. This has taken about 40,000 daily tons of production offline. And again, this just highlights um, the ongoing issues we've seen in Brazil. So this is one uh, uh, one positive to higher uh, iron ore prices is that we are continuing to see production issues in Brazil. But I think in the long run, um, barring any, uh, any geopolitical disagreements um, between China and Australia, I think Australia is going to be readily able to meet demand even if Brazil continues to see production interruptions.
Now to kind of continue on in this narrative, um, let's go to the next slide and just look at Met Coal. So we have seen um, China restrict imports from Australia. And why, why Met Coal is uh, a little bit uh, off, off our focus of iron ore and copper, it's still relevant, obviously, because um, ultimately iron ore is going into steel production and you need Met volumes to do that. And you'll notice that this year, China has uh, seen a steep decrease in Met Coal imports, driven by the fact that it has uh, de uh, decreased the amount of volume sourced out of Australia. And actually in April, for the first time, we saw volume hit nearly nil levels. Uh, you'll notice this is, this is a huge change, right, from historical levels. And so it's important to bring this up because there are geopolitical considerations when considering the iron ore market, especially when it comes to China and Australia. This relationship is very important. And if it breaks down, this could have serious negative impacts on the iron ore market because it would imply basically that China will be consuming less iron ore. Now, in the case of Met Coal volumes, China could theoretically, unlike in iron ore markets, could theoretically shift all its demand to alternative producers, but doing, but doing so will take time and effort, and we have not really seen a lot of that happen yet. I mean, yes, China has boosted a little bit more volume from Russia and the United States and from others, but not near enough to match its, its absolute import levels um, before the import ban that came into place late last year. Now, it's also interesting. China was relatively slow to kind of like fully implement the ban on Met Coal. This was not true in thermal coal markets. Um, pretty much beginning January, uh, China stopped importing all thermal coal from Australia. This was not true for Met Coal. They kind of still allowed some volumes to be imported, which means that I think they have concerns about finding alternative supplies. And there are, of course, questions that persist about how long China can keep up this behavior. Either they're going to have to find new suppliers, two, they figure out a way to um, come to terms with Australia, or three, they cut steel production. Now, there are um, early indications that the Chinese have had issues um, we've seen steel inventories trend lower since March. Now, this isn't a perfect indicator, right? This could just mean that downstream demand for things like automos, automotives are quite strong. But we have seen a decline in steel inventories that could indicate uh, mm -hmm. that, um, that the Chinese are having issues um, given their uh, cut to met coal. But this is just an important kind of secondary offshoot as we consider the iron ore market. Obviously, Met Coal is closely related. So just before I hand it off to Alex, a quick conclusion, right? Iron ore, uh, excuse me, copper markets look quite strong um, for the next several years because of supply constraints and because of a diversified demand base. This is not true in iron ore given a... Uh, uh, market for supply that has been readily willing to meet demand, and the fact that demand is centrally focused on one country, which is uh, which could be quite problematic. So with that, I hand it off to Alex to take on the oil market. Thanks, Reid. Um, so we wanted to, uh, to cover oil as well, just as uh, another example um, where we feel that there isn't the case to say that, yes, we are entering into this broad commodity super cycle. So I'm going to start off um, with a similar slide as seen across, uh, across the rest of the deck, looking at the uh, price moves of the uh, Brent um, curve. Uh, and crude oil going into uh, the summer of 2008 was, was the kind of the poster child is put here for the commodity super cycle. It was the kind of, whilst we saw across other, uh, other commodities, other bulks as we've covered already, that kind of 140, uh, 146, 147 number that we hit in July of 2008 was this real headline number, basically. Um, so following on from the demand shock experienced after the GFC, 
that which was kind of largely felt or majorly felt in uh, the middle distillates um, sector of uh, refined products. This is uh, a fuel for industrial growth, basically. We took two years in order to stabilize the balances and for crude prices to gradually climb back up to those three digit levels. Now, over kind of over the following uh, period, the rise of uh, US shale oil um, really set the stage for the for the next price crash that we saw in 2014, as uh, US shale producers uh, were far more effective than expected at, uh, with uh, technological developments in producing crude. Um, they overran their production following on from the crash, which just exasperated, exasperated problems more and more. Um, and it wasn't until we got to 2018 when the OPEC plus um, agreement came in to limit production that we could really start to see a significant rise in those prices. Now, we fast forward a bit to uh, spring of last year with the onset of the demand crash in uh, brought about by COVID uh, aligned with essentially the second price war uh, brought about by Saudi uh, Arabia and Russia, trying to combat the fact that actually um, US production had still just kept on marching on. There was just this basic a, a blip in time from the, uh, from the crash back in 14, um, and the, the sector was doing great guns from then on. So what we want to, what we want to highlight really now is why, uh, yes, crude oil prices have seen a strong recovery uh, since last year. Um, but as I showed in the, in the first slide, they're only fractionally higher in the scheme of things than we were back at the very start of January, uh, back of 2019. Now, the, the fundamental tenet of uh, a commodity super cycle is one of strong demand growth. And uh, I think anything that we're going to be seeing through the rep balance of this year and into likely the early 2022 uh, is, is essentially a base effect from that growth. And when that is the only demand growth that we're seeing, essentially is base effect from uh, devastatingly low levels, it's hard to really attach that to a story of a commodity super cycle. Ultimately, why, the, the reason why we've seen uh, this uh, good recovery in prices is because of OPEC Plus. They have done a very good job of reducing the supply um, of crude in the market at very to a very strong degree. So the chart that you can see here um, shows the change in exports um, from OPEC plus countries uh, versus the rest of the world, going back to that um, baseline agreement of October uh, October 2018 from the uh, the previous OPEC plus agreement. Now you can see that through all that time there was actually generally quite a marginal change in terms of OPEC plus um, production and in actual fact when the pumps were running um, back in April of last year that uh, decrease had been completely eroded and between Saudi, um, Russia and a handful, small handful of other countries we actually kind of increased our production relative to that baseline level. If you move on one month, though, you can see the massive decrease, and that has then just been sustained. But what you see um, from the rest of the world um, exports is that the the, the growth um, through uh, through 2019 has kept fairly stable. So um, there hasn't been that much of uh, that much of a decrease, basically, outside of OPEC plus. So. The, the fact that we really want to kind of to push home here is that the only reason at the moment why crude prices are supported is because of OPEC plus controls, basically. Now, in the longer term, uh, you could we could still see uh, stronger net balances with demand outstripping supply again, but that's 
once again, not because demand is exceptionally strong, it's because there's going to be increasingly over time downward pressure on production um, coming about from the pressure for um, majors to really get on board the energy uh, transition um, process and reduce um, their exposure to carbon, essentially. Um, so but that, that's something that's going to happen down the line. It's our assumption that in the near to midterm, spare production capacity from OPEC plus, as well as some continued growth from non-OPEC, um, the, uh, the likes of the US being a great example, are still going to be able to keep up with demand growth. Um, so to, to move on and kind of just uh, finalize the piece on oil and also just demonstrate uh, why we have seen um, this, uh, this sustained recovery in oil price, but why we think that, okay, going forwards, that isn't such the case. The chart here is looking at onshore oil inventories and, uh, and floating storage. So onshore inventories um, in the blue line, um, huge ramp up, um, which actually started um, earlier in kind of February and March of last year when uh, China was already building. So China is essentially feeling the impacts of, uh, of COVID-19 before the rest of the world was getting it. Their inventories were building already. Um, and then after that, the rest of the world and kind of the, the Western world was, was then essentially um, following on to build those inventories. Um, the, uh, the orange line that you see is also the increase in floating storage. Now, the charts here are on the same scale, um, but you can see that uh, on average, um, floating storage is holding at the kind of between 50 and 100 uh, million barrels. That essentially doubled to 200 million barrels um, by the time we hit summer last year. Now, floating storage has drawn down. That's not surprising. It's the kind of the most expensive uh, kind of form of storage in a way um, versus onshore. And it, with onshore inventories, um, OECD countries have drawn down. The, the vast majority of what's left in terms of that build back through spring of last year is essentially sat in China. So Chinese inventories peaked um, roughly in September. They've drawn down since, but then actually for the majority of this year, they've remained pretty flat, basically. Now, it is our assumption that those inventories are basically going to stay as they are. There's uh, been this a steady increase in uh, refining capacity that needs um, working crude in tank. And there has been a push um, by the Chinese government to build stocks in their strategic reserves. So those barrels aren't going to come out into the market in any meaningful sense. So Yes, it looks like we have far higher inventories that could potentially weigh on the market. However, they are in, uh, they're in locations that, being realistic, aren't going to be putting pressure. They're essentially just locked away now. Um, if, in fact, uh, there is still SPR capacity to fill, um, however, when the government was able to take advantage of spectacularly low crude prices last year, that's not the case now. So we're not likely to see um, any kind of real meaningful push um, into strategic reserves with crude prices where they are today. Now, to, to finalize, uh, we've said that uh, we don't think that there uh, is reason for kind of a sustained price growth in crude in the near term. Um, ultimately, the, the temptation as prices are at these levels and remain at these levels is that whether it's within uh, the OPEC plus countries or whether it's um, within some of the less um, controlled US uh, companies, as it were, there will be a, a temptation to gradually keep on increasing crude production where we are here, basically. Now, I mentioned the US. Uh, that has been the, the behavior of the US shell players has been a huge change through the course of the last year, year and a half. Um, and they, the, the major entities have a very strong um, incentive to maintain the discipline that they have so far. However, there are smaller players who have started to gradually increase um, investment in rigs, and there'll come a point where uh, 
uh, the incentive, say, moving into next year to start investing more in production may well just get too great. Ultimately, as uh, just to re recap what uh, Reid was running through, we very much like the story around copper. Iron ore has, uh, has some real headwinds in terms of uh, it's only really one country that is significantly supporting it. And there are some real concerns about the, the supply and demand uh, balance between, uh, between China and Australia. And ultimately crude, we're only seeing these price rises because OPEC plus is controlling the supply in that market. And they have the ability to bring back crude in line with demand um, over the course of, of the next few years as we very slowly, I still think, move out um, of this kind of COVID restricted demand period across many parts of the world. So we'll finish off with, um, with any questions. Um, and let me just see what we have. So I think we'll start with, if I go back to Reed, um, if we start with a question on iron ore. And so we, we mentioned how we aren't uh, kind of particularly confident, uh, I guess is the way of putting it, around iron ore, sustained iron ore demand um, in China. So the question is, wh why do you see an iron ore demand as problematic considering Chinese consumption? Yeah, I, uh, there are several points I think we need to consider here. Um, one, two points, really. One economic, one political. Um, the economic side of this is the fact that the Chinese have started to cut infrastructure spending. And this, in my mind, will begin to impact iron ore demand over the longer run. The question is whether the Chinese sustain this policy or not moving forward. That's kind of up in the air. If we see any kind of slowdown, will the Chinese just stand back in and spend more money on infrastructure again? It's hard to say. Uh, and, and two is political, right? And this takes me back to the Australian-Chinese relationship. China is going to try and find a way to, uh, if it can, diversify away from Australia, but it's gonna be very hard and it will take a long time to do so. And I think in the meantime, that represents a significant um, risk to iron ore markets. And the fact of the matter is that, you know, as I mentioned, the market itself is, is centrally dependent on China. So these two factors are very important and tend to be the reason why I'm dri driving this conclusion. Um Cool. So to, to follow on from that, we have a question on similar, uh, similar theme. Can China not rely on domestic met coal and higher EAF steel production to continue producing large amounts of steel? Yeah, this is, this is the question right now in the market. It is an unknown. I mean, we've not seen China cut, uh, cut their met coal imports by this volume ever before. Right. So it's it's a big unknown whether they can they can meet domestic steel demand. I would say it's it's going to be a middle point. Right. I, I think they're going to be able to manage finding alternatives through, you know, domestic production. We've already seen that happen. You know, they've already ramped production, domestic production for iron ore, um, especially over the last several months. Right. I, I, I think it will be able to meet part of their demand. But I think ultimately in met coal markets, they're going to need to pivot to alternative producers if they really don't want to purchase from Australia. And that's quite possible. They can, they can make that happen. And I think it's just going to take time. I, I think that's a more likely outcome than say China becoming more self-reliant because they just can't meet their demand levels, even, even if they wanted to uh, meet their domestic demand by producing and being completely self-reliant and being able to meet demand that way, very, very difficult. I mean, we're talking huge amounts of volume. So I, yeah, I, I would say far more likely that you, they will attempt to pivot to alternative producers. Excellent. Um, so slightly pivoting, um, I mentioned about uh, the possibility of US uh, producers 
um, coming back up. And I'm going to ask actually a question to one of my colleagues, Alex, who uh, we also have on the call, um, which is around more specifically the US. It's like, do, do current oil prices allow for a pickup in activity in the US? Um, and then I, we can probably follow on from that around if, if yes, how would OPEC react? Yes, so uh, I take this one, thanks. Um, so yeah, clearly with uh, oil prices at the current level, so around uh, 70, there has been a clear change in the, in the US. So that's really happened once we reach that, uh, that level. Reason is that uh, company are now uh, generating a lot of cash. It's the highest cash generation ever for the shell payers. I think we're around 30 billion expectation this year for all companies. So it's something we never had in the, in the sector. So even if we had some capital discipline um, mood, uh, I think, and that's what we see more and more on the company release, it looks like that in Q3, so in a couple of weeks, there will be a ramp up of CapEx because there is a good visibility for uh, the end of the year. They already generate uh, a lot of cash. So they will increase production again. That impact on higher capex will be more for 2022 than for 2021. So for this year, I think we could expect a 50,000 bar per day increase per month. So that's almost 0 0.3 to 0 0.4 um, by the end of the year compared to, to today and further for next year. Uh, I'm not sure if that it's enough, at least for this year, to change something on the OPEC, as we already speak about 0 0.3 to 0 0.4. And I think that's probably more linked to what can happen on Iranian oil, actually. Cool. Thank you. So I'll just finish off, just because we're coming up to the end of the session, finish off with a question uh, that we just had to check some numbers on. So um, asking which commodity has the strongest growth of uh, demand and for this we're looking at imports uh, essentially since since the beginning of the year um, and which lagging so if, if we just look at the commodities that we uh, have focused on today crude iron ore and copper um, the uh, it's actually crude which is down year on year to date um, not surprising considering we had kind of a strong or kind of a non-covid related uh, q1 uh, last year as well. So crude imports are down 1.5% year on year so far. Um, iron ore is up slightly. Um, so even though uh, China has continued to, to buy, um, iron ore is only up 1.7% year on year. So it's not great. And to kind of to, to reiterate this, the, the narrative that we've been saying, looking at copper, um, year to date compared with the same period last, uh, actually no, so this is year to date daily versus last year daily. Copper is up 9.1% uh, uh, on the year so far. So uh, it's really kind of reiterating just how much, uh, just the strength um, in the copper market that we're seeing now. And whilst on that headline chart that I showed at the beginning of the presentation, Iron ore was the standout runner and copper was, was only in the mix over the course of the last uh, two plus years. Um, this is why we think that there's kind of real, uh, real strength going forwards. So thank you for attending uh, the webinar today. Um, we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much.